Welcome to the Under the Lights podcast. The podcast for up-and-coming cinematographers, lighting camera operators, and photographers. Learn from the professionals and land the bigger projects. Please welcome your host, Cy Gamble. Welcome to Under the Lights episode 3. This week we've got another incredible guest, somebody I've had the pleasure to work with in the past. It's the photographer Vanson Tremo. And if you haven't heard of Vanson's work before, what I'd recommend you do is pause this podcast quickly, shoot on Google and search One Day I Will by Vanson Tremo and it's T-R-E-M-E-A-U. And that'll give you a really good idea of what we're going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes. Vansant joins us from his studio in Rome. As is the case with technology, we unfortunately had a few issues recording the second half of this pod. Due to connection issues, the audio quality gets a bit ropey after the first half, so if it's too difficult to hear Vansant, drop me an email to hello at utlpod.com and we'll try and get Vansant back on in a future episode. As always, if you like what you hear, drop us a like, comment, or even better, subscribe. If you really like it, please do share it with your mates. It really helps keep the pod going. So that's my little preamble out of the way. I'd like to now welcome Vansant Tremo to the podcast. Vansant, welcome to Under the Lights. Could you just explain to the listeners that don't know what your main line of work is? My photo work um, focus, focuses on uh, uh, documenting different crises around the world. Um, as a photographer, I try to portray um, the life and the resilience um, in these times of crisis. Um, I, I try to document um, different stories and I try to document the st- what's happening in those uh, different countries that are affected by a crisis. By crisis, I mean, I travel to conflict zone, uh, but also um, countries that are that are affected by different kinds of crises, such as uh, health crises, food crises. Um, and I try to, through my photo, I try to give a voice to um, those people who are actually suffering or living um, in um, living under this crisis and uh, I try to give them a voice through my photos so I do a lot of uh, interviews uh, that go along with my photos um, and I try to uh, write their story as raw as possible um, yeah yeah so um, if you could just take uh, take our listeners back a little bit and talk about how you got involved in this particular area of photography why i choose to uh, choose to do this uh, comes back a very long way um actually i i grew up in a small city of france in south of france called perpignan and in perpignan every year uh, they welcome uh, international festival of photojournalism so i grew up um all my childhood going to the festivals and uh, seeing the exhibitions there, um, displaying um, stories around the world um, that usually were about crisis actually also. And and I think at that time it was a window on the world, you know, Um, when I was a a 10 year old, a 12 years old, um, we didn't have internet. Um, so the windows on the world were TV, um, newspaper and those kind of events. So it really fascinated me because I was seeing things that uh, I wasn't seeing anywhere else. So, uh, as you were growing up, was there a particular person or a particular piece of work that helped to inspire you to become a photographer? So at that time, uh, I was very interested in the, in on in uh, on the photojournalism side and uh, and that international news uh, side of uh, of uh, of what i was seeing i remember my grandfather who was a painter at the time and he he painted one day um 
the photo that was uh, on all the flyers of the festival, uh, photo festival that year. And I remember that that portrait always impacted me. It was a portrait of uh, S- Steve McCurry. Um, and that year, um, it was the the number one portrait on all the flyers of the photo photojournalism j- festival, Visa pour l'image. Okay, so can you take me from this point of your younger self? Obviously, somebody inspired by this work, and how did you get to where you are today? And where did your first commission come from? I was I was very young at that time. And it's just an indicator, something on the way that inspired me, but I didn't know it at that time, and I, I didn't know what um, I didn't. It, it didn't trigger for me the will to do this, uh, but it was there. You know, what really made me fall in love uh, with photography is that um, I did um, I did a one year exchange in Argentina uh, when I was a student at law school. And um, so um, I was doing my master's degree there, and um, and I wanted to opening up a little bit um, to the city and uh, to its people actually, and uh, I was super shy. I was very very shy at that time. It was almost I would say kind of a disease, you know, because I was I I couldn't really. I don't know. I, I could not really talk to people uh, that easily, um, even to ask any random thing in the street, you know. Uh, I'd rather not ask because I was too shy. And so, so I was in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and um, learning Spanish. And obviously, it, it makes you opening up to other people. You have to. Um, and... And so I, I went to that photo school for like about four months um, to learn how to develop myself, my own photos. I had a camera and I thought, okay, uh, the best way to discover the city and engage actually will be to go around, walk randomly, take photos. And, uh, and I learned how to develop uh, in the dark room uh, my own photos. And this is the magic moment that made me fall in love with the process. Uh, seeing, seeing the photos appearing, you know, in the water, in the um, solution, um, and then having it as an object uh, made me really fall in love with photography. And, um, and from that moment, it never never left me actually so photography has become a bit of an outlet for you um a way to communicate with other people um you said it yourself it's a way for you to beat your shyness do you you think in that way uh do you think that way of communicating through photography has helped influence your work today it was a very I mean, I didn't know. I, it was something that I fell in love with, and and also the camera became a tool to fight my um, my shyness, you know. Um, because when you take a photo, if you want to take a photo of someone, you have to ask uh, his or her permission, right? Especially if you're in the street and you you don't know, you never met that person, and so it really made me fight my shyness. And uh, that was a great excuse to 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 discover the th- the city, but also uh, fight uh, this this problem of shyness I had. I found, and um, and then I I realized how I fell in love with the process of taking the photos, but also developing myself, the images, and and um, having those objects uh, at home after. Uh, that were drying all over my windows, you know. And um, I don't know how it influenced then my work uh, today, but uh, I think it's have always been there. I always uh, liked to talk to people and uh, ask them questions and, uh, and, and listen to them, you know. Yeah, and I, I think that's something that comes, it really comes across in your work. You, you'll always document and communicate the background behind a photo. You show uh, you show this alongside the images, and that's something that I really took on board and I, I learned from you from our time together in Ghana. You, you spent a lot of time getting to know your subject. You, you sat down and talked with them for 10, 15, 20 minutes before you even took the photo. 
and with that in mind, I would never have guessed that you were a shy person when you were younger. But just to bring us back on track a little, uh, I wanted to get a feel of how you turned your photography from a hobby into a livelihood. So after after that experience, I really I realized that uh, this is what I wanted to do uh, as as for my work, you know, um, and but I didn't know. I didn't know how to, you know, uh, especially uh, as a photographer. Um, and s- it is the same for many other artistic um, uh, vocations. Um, you can do a school, you can go to learn at school, but um, you don't apply for jobs after. So um, to me, it was all blurry how you make that happen, you know, how you become a photographer. Um, after that experience, I was almost graduating in law, uh, law school and I finished my, um, my um, I graduated uh, at law school, you know, uh, started working as a lawyer in a big corporate company. And um, after six months, I was still in that uh, I was. I felt still the urge to 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 um, to continue uh, taking photos, and uh, and I realized I, I really, I really didn't didn't see myself working as a lawyer, um, and uh, at that time, uh, I was about to. I was going to pass the bar exam actually. And uh, in the morning, on my way to go to the bar exam, I, <laughs> I was walking in the street in Toulouse, in south of France, where I did my law school. And I was keeping saying in my head, like, what if you succeed? What if you succeed? What's going to happen? Uh, I thought, like, uh, basically, if I succeed and I pass the bar exam, I thought, like, I'm, I'm going to be stuck and I'll have to be a lawyer. I, I wouldn't be able to quit ever, you know, and thinking about this, this, I realized like it, it wasn't really a good thing to, to have on your mind, right? To, if you think about like a, a negative aspect of your, of your action, there's something wrong, right? And so I real, I realized that on my, on my way and I just stopped and I t- took a turn and I never went to pass the bar exam. Oh my God. I, I, I knew you were ballsy, but not that ballsy. <laughs> and then I didn't go to, I didn't go to pass the bar exam and I quit my job that day and I decided to make a change. Wow. Uh, because I thought like if I was going to pursue something else that I really want to do, it's a waste of time. And you know, the more experience you get in the field, the, f- the further you are from uh, what you really want to do. Uh, and I knew I didn't want to do this as a hobby, you know. So, so what happened after you quit? So then I actually started working as a volunteer uh, in a um, non-governmental organization, in NGOs. Uh, I went to Pakistan, I went to Congo as a volunteer. And, um, and I started taking photos, um, on the field, uh, the, during, uh, during my work. Um, and I also met different photographers who showed me that, uh, it was actually possible. And, um, because I had, I had everything clear in my mind, uh, from there that, uh, I wanted to work as a photographer, but I didn't want to rush it too much because uh, you need to build a portfolio, you need gear, and this doesn't happen over a day. Um, like, uh, you know how it is for a photographer or a filmmaker, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the cost of a camera. Uh, so, so if you want to have professional gear, um, and if you have zero on your account, well, it takes 
a bit of time and work to be able to save the money and um, and invest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I did this while working as a humanitarian. I got like um, from a volunteer, I became um, a project manager, and for a few years I worked as a humanitarian ed worker. Um, and I was taking photos uh, aside of my work as a hobby, but still having in mind that at some point I was going to uh, be a photographer. And knowing I wanted to become a photographer, I saved the money, I invested in, in, in my gear until a point where I actually, um, I actually, I built a network with time also. So I was working in uh, different NGOs and people were knowing I was taking photos and, uh, you know, I built a little website and until the day where I uh, had saved enough money to actually work for one year as a freelance photographer. So I knew that I could live for one year without any income. Uh, I would, I gave myself a chance of, uh, being a photographer for one year because I realized also that if you want to be a photographer, you have to be, you have to be it, you have to be one, you know? So it means you have to be available and it has to be your, what your work, what you do. So when you meet people and they ask you what you do, you know, you're a photographer, you're not someone who's doing something and doing a photography aside of it. So I gave myself uh, one year. So you had a year to build the foundations for your entire photography career. Uh, at what point did your first paid commission come and uh, what was it? Yeah, so my first commission work uh, was um, an assignment in Central African Republic. I had been there uh, before uh, with uh, my work as a humanitarian ed worker and I had taken photos there and uh, on my first assignment I was uh, I was sent there by uh, by an NGO um, it was a civil war there and uh, I was there I, I was sent there to document um, this complex situation and uh, stories um, about what what was happening there and stories from uh, the internal displaced people uh, who had to leave their home and took refuge in different parts of uh, the country. So from then on, your your work kept you in Africa. Um, you actually moved to Senegal for a while. Were you always there or did you move around? I lived in, I started as a freelance photographer in Congo. Um, I was based in Goma in Eastern Congo. This is where I started as a freelancer. So I also realized that if you want to have a sign, if you want to have, um, uh, at that time, since I was starting, I thought if I want to have commission work, I better be based in a place where I know, uh, there would be work and also where I know there isn't much competition or much, uh, not that many other photographer. And uh, what was it like living in Congo back then? I knew the country, so uh, I know Congo very well. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, very well to my <laughs> to my little knowledge. At least I, I know I know a bit uh, because I've been there many many times, but. Uh, it was uh, it was fine. It was the beginning of an adventure. I I, I can't say it was, e it was easy to be honest, uh, because um, where I was based, you know, you don't have. I didn't have the facilities that you can have uh, if anywhere you live. You can live in Europe, um, and uh, it was the very beginning of that adventure. So. I was trying to figure out how to even do, do the job. And, uh, you know, like, it's not just about like the ability to take photos. It's about, uh, it's about, uh, learning how you actually interact with clients and, uh, and how you find clients and, uh, how you create your opportunities. Um, so the struggle was not only about like being in a place where it's complicated to move around or the insecurity sometimes, but it's about figuring out everything about um, the, this new work, you know? So would you say your big break came from One Day I Will? Was that the thing that really put you on the map? 
Yeah, I think it's different things. Um, one day I will, uh, before it became one day I will, uh, was just a series of photos I took on my very first assignment, actually. Uh, in Central African Republic. Um, I did that series of photos and um, and there was something interesting in it and that, that really captured something that I, in myself that I was into, into like, I don't know, it, uh, I, was, I was very um, surprised and fascinated by the, the outcome of that series. Uh, first series I had done in Central African Republic. I thought uh, we were in a very desperate uh, situation. And uh, I thought the kids, what they were displaying uh, in that series of photos was very strong. And uh, and also it, it was giving hope, you know, seeing that uh, they were expressing their dreams and uh, I don't know. There was something very, very strong in this. And it, I, I had this on my mind for a while. And so I decided to do that same, same series, same concept in another country then. And then another one and then another one. And until it became uh, actually one day I will, a project, you know. So it started with, a, I didn't imagine that it would go such a long way when I started it, you know. Um, so it's a, it's a process that evolved with time and uh, consistency, co consistency, you know, and, um, and then eventually one day I pitched it to National Geographic and, uh, and, uh, they decided to run it and, um, that, that brought uh, lots of visibility on it for sure. Uh, but it also brought credibility to this, to this series. And from this, I, I was able to actually uh, get funding to continue the project and also uh, to have the first of a long series of exhibitions a bit everywhere in the world. We're going to take a quick break here. And in the second part of this podcast, we'll be talking more about Vansant's work and specifically more about One Day I Will Too. Just a reminder that in the second half of this pod, the audio quality isn't quite up to the same standards as what was in the first half of this pod. Hopefully it's still audible. But before we get to that, here's a quick message about a fantastic competition that we're running to win a signed copy of Doug Allen's book, Freeze Frame. We'll be back soon. Under the Lights Podcast. Hello, it's me again, back to tell you about our fantastic competition that we've got to win a personalised and signed copy of Doug Allen's book, Freeze Frame. All you have to do is answer the following question, which is, Doug Allen graduated from university in 1973 with a degree in which subject? That is, Doug Allen graduated from university in 1973 with a degree in which subject? Send your answers to hello at utlpod.com, short for under the lights pod, and we'll draw a winner at random on our Facebook page at utlpod at the end of this series. Get your entries in now. Under the Lights Podcast. Welcome back to the second half of Under the Lights with Vincent Tremo. Vincent, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your work on One Day I Will. From what I remember you telling me, the idea came from a shoot that wasn't quite working and you had to think on your feet to fix that. Um, wh where did the idea come from? How did it all start? Uh, I was on an assignment and, uh, and uh, the kids were deprived of going to school and um, because the school was destroyed and uh, because, um, because of the civil war then, it had been one year, they had taken refuge in a, in a, on a church compound and they couldn't go out of there. And um, it was a very dramatic situation. And there were hundreds of kids running everywhere. They had nothing else to do, uh, no more school. And so on that day, I started talking with a little girl about actually school. I asked her, what is school for you? Do you miss going to school? And, um, and she started telling us those horrifying stories about what happened to her, her parents on her last day to school. And uh, that was actually too horrifying, too traumatizing, especially for her, but for 
us too, actually. We all <laughs> we all came up with tears, actually, uh, listening to this. And there was no way I was going to... I, w- I wasn't there to make a young girl cry by talking about the horrifying events she had to go through uh, in the past year, you know. And, um, and so... After that, I thought like it, so, so it, it puts a dilemma because um, I, as a photographer uh, documenting what's, what's happening, I, I wanted, I needed to find a way to actually tell what was going on and tell her story in, in some ways that uh, respects her and doesn't traumatize her. Uh, but also I need to convey the message of what's happening. And that's how I ended up with that idea of asking um, asking those children to come up to me, telling me what they want to become when they grow up, and go find a costume that would rep- represent it. Um, that's that's the, the concept, the spirit of One Day I Will. And that way, it, beca- it became a playful game uh, where all the kids who were around me uh, on that in that compa- compound that day, they went uh, around to find props, uh, and they came back to me with those props representing what they want to become when they grow up, and they were so creative in their ability to represent their wish that that it really impacted me. It fascinated me. And uh, the, the creativity of the youth is fascinating. No limits, you know. And, and that's why I then, on another assignment after, I decided to, to, to replicate the same, the same concept because I was curious to see if the kids would be as creative as in Central African Republic. And they were at the end. And so that's how actually when you have one series and then a second, one thing leads to another. And I did this in nearly 20 countries as of today. It's incredible. Um, Did you know at the time of taking the first photograph that it would become as big as it is now? that Nat Geo, National Geographic, would pick it up and you'd have all these exhibitions all over the world? Of course, I never knew it. It was I started this on my very first assignment, you know. So it was uh, it, it's just a surprise, and it, it still is a surprise actually uh, how it evolves. But I had no idea it was going to become a project, and I had no idea it was going to become such a big project. And as of today, maybe I have no idea how even bigger it's going to become. Who knows what's going to become um, next, you know. But um, I, I just did it uh, with my heart, and because I, th- I thought it was, um, it was playful. Really, it was fun to do. Uh, it was a great way to interact with the kids, and uh, you know, uh, have them enjoy uh, the moment. Have me enjoying the moment also, because um, it's always. Uh, Beautiful, you know, to to see all those kids smiling, especially when you're in a pl- in a place uh, uh, where which is a conflict zone, you know. So um, it's 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 a beautiful moment to see moments of joy and uh, and um, and children happy to participate uh, to such uh, activity. But I did it because I thought it was important. It was a great way to convey a message, also. And um, and um, and yeah, one one series that was the first time, and then um, it caught it caught attention, and um, I really wanted to explore what would be to do it again in some of the places, and um, and that's how it built up a little by little as a as a long term project. So, Vanson, I wanted to ask you about your other work, your your less well known assignments, and how do you keep them interesting? How do you keep developing professionally on assignments that maybe 
aren't all that interesting. Even on a, on jobs and all, I'm pretty sure you can always find a way to 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 do th- something that you will keep for yourself. I I once had dinner with uh, with like uh, le- legendary uh, photojournalist, uh, and I remember. <laughs> So I was I was starting, you know, and the guy is sixty years old. So forty, he had forty more years of experience than me, you know. And the guy tells me, when you're on assignment, it's dedicate your time. So it's twenty percent for the client, eighty percent for yourself. And I was like, wow, well, you must be very confident to be able to provide the client. Uh, a quality content with just 20% of your time, you know. But he was telling me that each assignment, you should see each assignment as a grant, you know. And uh, and I, I'll always remember that because I thought that he was right, you know. Uh, you, if you do something that you're not that passionate about, um, just find a way to actually make it yours and, uh, and you, you do the project and you're doing well, of course, but you have to keep something for yourself. And on in each assignment as a photographer, uh, I also I take photos for, for, the, for my client who commissioned me the, 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 the work, but I also take many different photos, you know, that are meaningless sometimes, but I just... I just like it, you know. I do it uh, in a very uh, natural or without thinking too much. And then sometimes, after years after, those in- insignificant photos I've been taking aside, they they get a new meaning, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, Van Sant, we're approaching the end of the podcast, but just to move this on a little bit, um, I just wanted to ask you how you actually prepare for an assignment. And by that, I mean, how do you work with the client to obviously align yourself to what they're trying to achieve? Before an assignment, um, there's usually several days um, where I, um, if I don't know what the situation, I document myself. Um, if it's on a commissioned assignment, uh, my client usually send me briefs. Um, but this is for knowing about the situation. Then depending on the kind of assignment it is, obviously I decide on uh, what kind of gear I'm going to take with me. Yes, of course, I always know uh, what's going on. Uh, I look online also. I'm always... Uh, checking the news, of course, uh, so I know a bit the situation. And if I work for uh, United Nations, uh, usually I they share with me the um, figures and uh, uh, situation reports. Can I ask you what equipment you take with you on these assignments? Is it a set kit list? Do you have lights? Um, have you got a particular camera that you prefer? Um, my main camera is a Leica M10 with a 35 millimeters lens. Um, and then I have a Canon 5D um, that is that I can use with a, with a 7300. I even have um, a backup 5D just in case. And do you take lights? I know we use lights on uh, One Day I Will in Ghana, but is, is that a regular thing? So the only time I shoot with the light is for one day I will. Uh, or if I know I want to set up a, f- a studio in a refugee camp or in those remote places, sometimes I travel with a, with an external light. But this is to set up a studio, so this is to do really portraiture, uh, stage portraiture and uh, and uh, because this is quite a, a big light. Um, otherwise, I, I never use flash. So I never use artificial light ever. Just to round off the main part of this podcast, I, I wanted to ask you how you feel you build that level of consciousness into your work. And by that, I mean that ability to look at an image and look into an image and, and understand exactly what a person is thinking and feeling. 
we spoke earlier about how you use text to to inform the images that you that you produce. Um, does it go beyond that? I I spend way more time talking to the people than the time to take the photos. Uh, when I take when you take a, a portrait, it it can be done in in like le- in less than a minute, right? When I might have talked to that person for half hour before or even more. Um, so I think the the first thing is to is to actually get to know uh, the person before. The, the camera is a tool, you know. It's uh, it's a tool you use you use it to reproduce an image, but uh, it's a tool that is that I use to actually tell stories and, um, and, and give the opportunity to the people I meet to express themselves sometimes. Um, and, um, and that's for the portraiture part. Um, but sometimes also I, I like to come back on the images I've been taking, uh, over the past years. And, uh, when you work on assignments of photographer, I it's everything is a run. So you you go on assignment for like two weeks or three weeks. You take lots of photos every day. Then you edit, deliver, and then you go on something else. Um, it becomes a, a job. So you don't chill hours a night on your photos. Um, you know, I do something else. Um, but sometimes I like to come back on on some of my photos and in trying to to understand, I took that photo uh, instinctly, you know, uh, with my instinct, uh, and I try to take the time to understand why did I take that image, and because there's there's probably something that is a uh, meaning deeper than just the instinct of taking that image. And um, a lot of time, I actually find the meaning, or I can I can see and understand um, the meaning of that image, you know, or the meaning I want to give it. And um, and this is the mo- mo- moment where it's more calm, you know, and I can uh, think about like take an hour, you know. Let's say you, you you look at one image and you give yourself one hour to write on it and, uh, and understand where it comes from and why you took that specific image. That's it. And that's the key to understanding all, all good photography is, is communicating that why, why the image is taken, whether that be just visually through the image itself or, or with a supporting text as well. Is that as important? It depends on the kind of photography, of course, and, uh, and, but I think it's always more stronger and more interesting um, if next to a portrait uh, you have the background story and uh, testimony of the person who's portrayed. It gives a whole new meaning. As for myself, when I share it, more personal thoughts, or um, I don't do it because uh, people will like it. This, as I told you, I, you never know what people will like or will not. So I actually, uh, I never do things because I think people will like it. I, I do things because I like it and I think it's important or interesting. And if I think it's important, I guess it, it, it could resonate in uh, other people's heart too. I want to bring this chat into the 21st century and ask you how you use social media and in particular how you use Instagram to promote your work? Instagram is, um, is something, posting on Instagram is something I, I started years ago to share my, uh, to share what I was doing, my, my images, you know, uh, because I was tired of uh, chasing editors and having no email answer. I thought, well, the goal of taking photos is to show to people. So, if if I can't really get through it because editors don't answer me, then I'll go showing directly to the people. <laughs> <laughs> so I started doing this on Instagram, 
and being consistent on it, posting uh, frequently and and trying to be meaningful uh, definitely uh, brought me credibility over the years, uh, little by little. Um, and uh, and I, it definitely brings opportunities. Can I ask you how you build your Instagram? Like it's it's very much in a gallery format, and by that I mean you consciously. And I remember you saying this to me in in Ghana: is that you you mix up your close ups, your mediums, and your wide shots to make sure that you haven't got two of the same together to make sure your gallery is as varied as possible. Is that is that your sort of Instagram strategy as such? Have you got any other tips for our listeners? Yeah, of course. I'm trying uh, to be aesthetically smart so 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 the photos can pop out uh, when they are in miniature you know so that means by not not putting for example two close-ups next to each other and then four landscape photos from very far uh, next to each other um, it's better to put one uh, portrait and then one landscape and then maybe one medium shot so when you look at them as miniature, uh, you know they don't blend together, but each single one can pop out. You know, that's some nice advice. I like that, and uh, it's obviously working because your yeah, Instagram's up to about seventy thousand followers, and it's probably double from when I last checked. Um, we've got to just move on to some audience questions now, as we're rapidly approaching the end of the podcast. And our first question is, if you could give one piece of advice to a budding photographer, what would it be? It's to first work on something that is uh, important to you, uh, rather than working on something that you think is going to please people. Work on th- something that is that has meaning to you. Second uh, part is to do, shoot, shoot it, don't overthink it shoot 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 and then uh, you'll see but uh, being productive all the time uh, is key i would say i, I think uh, i tend to or oh, i tended to overthink too much and at the end you, you don't do anything when you overthink so it's better to do and then you think along the way and you and you and when you you're in that dynamic that reason of productivity you figure out and the uh, and last advice I would say is to, to see the work of the masters. Um, so books and exhibitions, less exhibitions at the moment. So books from the, the iconic photographer that you like or that are recommended to you, uh, be inspired. Um, in my case, you know, I'm, I don't actually, it can sound weird or funny, but I don't actually look at uh, photo journalist, uh, journalistic um, work that much. Um, my favorite uh, inspirations are painters and different kind of other things in the arts, you know, but it's combination of not only photography. So uh, I would say be inspired look at the, the the work of the masters of photography but also other things that's great i think we got three answers in one question there um just a quick reminder that if you want to submit any further questions for our future guests just drop us an email to hello at utlpod.com uh just a quick one vance on our final question uh from our audience questions section is if you had to pick one photographer that inspired you who would it be uh, I have a special place in uh, my heart for Sebastião Salgado uh, because a photographer I had met at the time uh, when I was uh, a volu- volunteer in an NGO. She showed me his work, you know, and uh, I really fell for it uh, because it, it was actually combining my my work and my passion and it kind of showed me or made me imagine the way so and obviously his uh, his work uh, all his life is incredible 
Great. Thank you so much, Vance. On the final section of our podcast is our weekly Desert Island kit bag. You're stranded on a desert island. You're only allowed to rescue three items from your boat to take with you to document your time. Which three pieces of kit would you take? You've got one light, one camera and one lens. If I was on a desert island with, uh, with just a small bag, um, I'd take my Leica M10 and my 35mm uh, lens and that's it. And that's it. And that is it. That's the end of the podcast. And another photographer opting for natural light, surprisingly, over any other. I think we're going to have to change that section slightly. But thank you once again for listening. If you've enjoyed the podcast, drop us a like, comment, or even better, a share. If you'd like to leave some feedback or submit an audience question, please email hello at utlpod.com. That's short for under the lights. Thank you once again for listening. The next episode is out on Monday. I'll see you soon. Under the Lights Podcast.